uh, firstly, I would like to thank everybody for joining us today for the mechanics lecture series. And particularly, I would like to welcome Alf Professor Alfredo Guineto, uh, uh, or I would call him Alfredo, is a very good friend of mine. We have known each other for uh, several years now. I, and uh, Alfredo was, uh, did his PhD at University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. And uh, later, he was a postdoc at the Institute of Continuum Mechanics in Hanover in Germany. And uh, that is the time when I was also a PhD student at that time. Uh, and he was a postdoc there. And uh, later on, he joined uh, as assistant professor at the University of Sao Paulo. And now he's associate professor there. He has been working on the area of contact mechanics, particularly with uh, beams and plates and shells for a long time. And uh, his work has culminated into a very nice software called Giraffe that he has developed and he has been using it for a lot of very interesting applications from turbine blades to uh, textile composites as well. And I'm very much looking forward to the talk and I don't think I would, I would find a better person today to speak about the uh, contact of structural elements uh, better than Alfredo here today. And especially with some of his recent papers, if you look at it in computational mechanics on uh, uh, master to master contact is a very interesting uh, approach that has come up with that uh, generalizes the general idea of slave and master uh, kind of ideas that are there in contact mechanics. Uh, I would uh, definitely, some of these papers are also added into our uh, list of publications that are listed in, on our website. And I, I would leave, give the floor to Alfredo to, uh, to start the lecture. Thank you very much, Alfredo, for accepting the invitation. And it's really a pleasure to have you here. And especially on a Saturday afternoon for joining us and. Uh, uh, I'm looking forward to this wonderful lecture. Thanks a lot, Ajay, for the very nice introduction. It's a great pleasure also uh, for me to, to, to take part of this uh, mechanical lecture series. It's a nice, uh, I think it's a nice uh, initiative you are, you are doing. And uh, yeah, so thanks. And uh, it, it's quite nice. Uh, uh, who is the researcher that do, uh, doesn't like to talk about his work? So that, that's a nice opportunity to to discuss nice things about contact mechanics and uh, and so on. So okay, I probably uh, you are already uh, seeing my screen. So I will come to the to the presentation, and uh, I would like to ask you, please, if you have some questions, do not hesitate to 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 maybe open the microphone and ask me at any time, or even uh, chat something in the, in the, in the Google Meet chat. And yeah, please let me know if you have questions. I, I plan to make some uh, small breaks uh, uh, during the during the talk, in order to provide you a, a, a let's say a, a better uh, a better let's say a moment for for talking something or to ask you something to me. So please uh, let's do like this. Uh, I have a, a kind of um, a large number of slides to show here. I, Actually, I prepared something maybe larger than the, what I intend to do here, let's say one half hour, something like that. But uh, I decided to, to prepare a larger scope because then I can provide you a PDF with more things if you wanted to have a look afterwards. Okay, so that's the idea. Okay. So please let me know if you are seeing my PowerPoint now. Yeah, I can see the PowerPoint. Okay. Thanks, uh, Ajay. So that's it. So, yeah, now I cannot see you anymore. I just see my screen in the, in the PowerPoint. So uh, <laughs> I hope you keep seeing. Uh, so the, the title of the presentation today is Pointwise Contact Numerical Models and Applications. So what I intend to do uh, by the moment is to uh, talk to you first an introduction about contact. And uh, I will go very, uh, let's say, fast at the beginning uh, in this introduction, because actually I'll talk about modeling a single body and multi-body systems. This is kind of thing that probably most of you already are very familiar with, but it's good to, to have at least a brief introduction on the topic. Then uh, why that? To talk, to, to talk about the topic number three here, this is my main topic here, is the contact constraint. So here I will introduce how to, to manage contact mechanics uh, while solving a, a flexible body, general flexible body, uh, or, or system of multiple uh, flexible bodies uh, interacting, and so on. Then, uh, yeah, after that, after we establish how to manage contact as a constraint, a mechanical constraint, 
Then we I'll go into the, let's say, the master master contact uh, schemes. I will explain a little how it works. And then finally, at, at number five, a general point-wise contact formulation, very briefly. That's, the, let's say, the more uh, up-to-date uh, to topic of my uh, research. And just then a small, let's say, chapter. It's uh, solving the local contact problem that has some uh, particular issues that I will comment a little on. And finally, I'll go to conclusion not look of this uh, works. So let's get it started by an introduction about contact. If you have a look at this uh, image here, you can see that uh, two, two, let's say, uh, common uh, engineering uh, scenarios of interest, for example, wheel rail interaction, and also the tire and ground uh, interaction. In, 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 the, in, the, in the left side, the, the wheel rail interaction, for example, you have two uh, metal, uh, metals uh, to, to very let me see, hard uh, parts uh, experiencing contact in a very small region. For example, in the side uh, size usually of a, of a coin, a small coin. So we have usually very large uh, pressures, for example, and many uh, related interesting phenomena such as rolling contact fatigue, for example, or wear localized wear and in such regions of rails and so on. So this. Uh, this kind of uh, interest from the engineering perspective is quite, it's quite, uh, let's say, uh, uh, it's quite important. Yeah, because the industries and uh, let's say companies that use, for example, this kind of uh, trains or heavy haul, for example, transportation and so on, when the issue also is uh, security and so on, you should avoid, uh, let's say, for example, crack propagations and to avoid accidents as, uh, uh, Unfortunately, in the past, we had already some accidents due to that. So sometimes these problems come due to contact issues that uh, are these very uh, large uh, uh, loads that take place in contact regions. And, and then on the right side, this tire ground interaction, this is a quite a very complex system when you have also mud together. So you have a third body, let's say, or even more than three bodies. In this case, you have the, the tire, you have the ground, you have the particles, stones, and, and gravel, many, many things, uh, many complex systems, for example. So all these uh, are practical uh, contact, uh, let's say, situations that we can find in our life. And what you can see by now is that contact is a complex phenomenon. It's multi-physics phenomenon. Actually, it has uh, mechanical actions, of course, that uh, may, may, uh, may occur, and, but it also, uh, is related to heat transfer, to chemical reactions sometimes. You can have corrosion, for example, that, that have influence on something. We have wear, lubrication, electricity, conduction, and many uh, things like this that always multi physics in the phenomenon. So I would give here some brief examples of some works that uh, I developed in, with my group uh, of students in Brazil. And uh, for example, that we used contact models so uh, I will show to you the, the objective of these examples is to show you how can we take advantage of some contact models together with finite elements or other uh, schemes that we can also uh, can apply, let's say, to, to try to, to predict and solve some engineering problems. For example, in this case here, so we have offshore risers for oil exploitation. For example, you have a big, let's say, a beam model structure that's a slender structure actually you have here. The, 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 the surface of the, of the sea, you have here the, 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 sea, the seabed. Then uh, you have, to, for example, some configurations of these structures that you have this region of the, this, this very slender structures called the riser, for example, it's actually a tube, sometimes used for, uh, for oil uh, transportation from, from the bottom to the top uh, region, for example. Uh, yeah, so you have, for example, here this touchdown zone, and this can be a really issue because you, you, you this is a hot spot for fatigue uh, issues, for example, in this kind of structure. So to, let's say to very well model this kind of problem, you need actually to model the contact of this structure with the seabed, for example. So this is a first example that I give here. Then I uh, also come to the, for example, pipelines in contact ground. This can be also uh, offshore uh, or, or, or onshore. Uh, uh, and you can uh, have some imperfections, for example, in the ground you have, and we'd like to study here how friction plays a role here, for example, contact and contact together with friction, of course, the, 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 the this tangential component of contact forces that they may really uh, have influence, for example, in the buckling 
loads of this kind of structure. So the, this, uh, for example, study that we, de we developed in this case. So also we need some contact model for, for uh, modeling that using finite limits, for example. And also, we are very uh, uh, simple, let's say, uh, image. Actually, this is not a realistic uh, surface, but uh, only a schematic uh, wheel. Uh, actually, it's a wheel set. And here's some, like, uh, to represent some uh, idealized sections of rails. Of course, it's not uh, this is a quite old uh, work already, but uh, you can here some, have the concept of a wheel set rolling in uh, two, let's say, rails. Then, so uh, uh, here for railway applications, generally you have uh, also models. Woven composites, for example, when you use beans, there is a student of mine, uh, Celso, who is uh, doing his PhD in this topic, for example, improving this kind of models that we started developing some years ago. And uh, we can also handle, for example, contact between rigid and flexible bodies. For example, here it's a beam model uh, structure. As you see here, there's an uh, I-shaped beam, for example. And uh, yeah, and here there's a, a, a trolley. Uh, it's modeled by a, by a rigid bodies only, and then you can have contact of the bottom of the beam here with the wheels of this trolley. So yeah, this is another. This is an example that's published in this paper here, for example. After you can, of course, download all these papers and have a look uh, on all the details of these uh, simulations I'm here showing. Okay, so uh, after this uh, brief introduction, I will start with, uh, let's say, a, a review about how to model a single flexible body. So I start here. Imagine that we have, uh, uh, let's say, a body here. I will, so we have a solid body. I call it D, uh, W. This uh, W index here, I will keep here. Uh, at the moment, we have only one body. So this W index here is, uh, we, we don't need that actually. You could just say that it's solid B. But I'll keep this W index here because after I will introduce a second body, so the W will be the, let's say, the, the, the can be the value one, two, or three, uh, as many bodies as we want. So that's why we are uh, using always this W sub index here. So we start with the, the solid body here. You have many material points that we can find here. We have uh, the referees configurations, uh, which are the, depicted by this vector x. And, and of course, this may uh, have a, a transformation here. You can have a deformation of, uh, of, uh, from this uh, referees configuration to the, to the uh, curate one. And each material point is now in another position. Uh, it has experienced a displacement u. W and uh, the new position is the X at the, the lower case here. Okay, so yeah, and usually you can write, for example, the equilibrium equation in the, in the spatial form. Here is a differential equation. Uh, I think all of you are familiar with, uh, with this already. It's the divergence of stress tensor. This is Cauchy stress uh, plus the the volume the volume uh, load field. Yeah, equal to uh, the specific mass times the acceleration. So you can have this for, uh, for each uh, material point of your uh, body. Okay, this is something that you have. You also have the boundary conditions. You have Dirichlet boundary conditions uh, in the region of your domain, and also the Neumann boundary conditions. As usual, this is uh, something very, uh, let's say, uh, classic. And uh, the objective of this problem, let's say that when you have this, uh, usually you, you have some loads that you would like to find what's the displacement field, what's the velocity field, and what's the acceleration field, and what's the stress field actually in each material plot. So that's why it's a field. So we have many, we have infinite results that we are interested in. We, are, we would like to know the results in the whole domain of the body. Then. Uh, our uh, boundary conditions and loads are considered to be null. And uh, so mathematically, we are facing an initial boundary value problem. So we have the solution a long time that we would like to have. And we, and we also need the solution in space. So uh, we can uh, here see the problem as for example, imagine that we have a given instant. So we can freeze the configuration. And then at that configuration, we have a given uh, displacement field, you have a state given by this uh, velocity and acceleration fields and also the stress in each material point. 
but the system is changing every time, so you, you have a, a different, let's say, uh, uh, you can find many, let's say, uh, uh, screenshots let's, of the system and say, uh, while the, the time is going. Okay, the, the, and we need to solve this system a long time when we, when we are talking about a dynamic problem. For example, when it's in statics, you just are interested in a single, uh, uh, usually in a single uh, uh, shot of this, of this system, let's see. So, uh, you have distinct strategies uh, for solving such a kind of problem. Usually when you find a long time, you have finite different schemes in space. Usually you have finite element schemes or other methods as well. Many, many elements exist. Recently, virtual element method, meshless methods, you have many things. Yeah, but usually to treat this kind of problem, for example, coming to the framework of finite element, what's quite, it's quite a common way to do that, usually you have to transform that equation that I've, I've just mentioned, that, that's the equilibrium equation for the dynamical system that I talked, you have to, to, weak it, uh, to write the weak form of this equation. So after some uh, algebraic manipulation and so on, you can find this equation usually, which is written here actually uh, in its uh, spatial form. Actually, if you have a look here, you, this is a way to, to, to write an equation actually for a non-linear, for a geometrically non-linear system, but it's quite similar, uh, looks like a quite similar way to the, to the linear system equations. The big difference uh, is that here our integral, uh, the integral is done over the deformed domain. So this is a big issue actually. So usually you don't use this equation as it is here to solve directly your problem. You have to make another transformation. I'll, I'll talk uh, in the next slide. But I, I like to, to show this equation this, uh, this way because uh, uh, it's correct, and, and also it, uh, it's quite familiar for whom uh, that is already uh, familiar with uh, linear systems, for example. So here you can see clearly some contributions to this equation. That's the, here the internal uh, loads uh, contribution to the, to the weak form, the external loads, and the, the kinetic energy uh, contributions. So this, you have this equality here. For this uh, arbitrary virtual displacement, it's called also test function, this guy here that uh, introduce it here in order to establish our weak form. So, usually, uh, as I said, this is called the spatial form of the equation. When you want actually to solve that properly in a numerical model and compute something, um, you have many options actually how to transform this equation, but one of, uh, usually you have to use this kind of mappings that we do. So we use the, the uh, usually you can, uh, uh, transform things and redefine some quantities at the reference configuration, such as, for example, the piola kirchhoff stress tensors, for example, and also some loads here that you define with respect to the reference configuration and so on. With that, you take advantage of that, define a Jacobian here to, 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 to transform these coordinates here for, actually, it's a mapping that we are talking here, so you can change uh, your integral. Now it's already, it, it's gone back to the, to the reference configuration, which is quite convenient. So it's easier to handle the problem this way. So uh, you pay for that, the price of uh, having more, uh, let's say, abstract quantities in the integrals. But you have the advantage of having the integral over the, the reference configuration, which is now, because you know from the beginning, okay? So that's the basic idea. So as I said, this is a, just a brief introduction. You can uh, handle this problem with uh, Lagrangian sch schemes to describe, let's say, the, the movement of each material point. Usually you can find usually total Lagrangian or updated Lagrangian ones. And uh, you also can handle displacement and rotations according to convenience. And there are many ways to do that. Okay. Um, just a small break for questions. Some question by now? Please let me know. No questions, please. Let me see if in the chat there's something. Nothing? Okay. Okay, I'll keep going, so. So now let's go to some, let's say, uh, prior to entering the contact things yet, I'll just uh, give a, a small introduction about some structural formulation that I'll use afterwards together with my contact models that I'll show. So, for example, geometrically exact beam model. What's this? Uh, this is a quite convenient way to describe a beam. It's, uh, it comes uh, from the, the previous works from uh, from Simo, for example. I, I, I'll show the, 
the, the some refuses the next slide. But basically, it's a bin uh, formulations where you you, you treat every uh, cross section uh, movement as a general weighted body movement. So you can handle with these large displacements and finite rotations. That's quite convenient. So you have the bin axis refuse configuration. You can define a general point on the cross section of the bin in at the refuse configuration. This ER here. Then uh, you rewrite such uh, general point here at, uh, at configuration I plus one here. This is an updated Lagrangian scheme. That's why we have this configuration I and I plus one. But you can also handle that in a uh, total Lagrangian scheme as well. Uh, yeah, uh, the, the trick here is that you, you, you can uh, write this uh, point, this uh, AR vector here, you can, uh, uh, this, this vector can uh, actually uh, present uh, an arbitrary rotation that's uh, depicted here in this uh, tensor key. Yeah, and uh, also you have the translation of, the, of a given point of your cross section given by the Z. So uh, that's, that's the kinem basic kinematic description we have in this model. After, the, after that, you have to, des to describe some uh, kinematic incremental fields. And at the end, you, uh, I, will not, I will not go into details about these strain quantities, but just give you an idea. This, we have two strain quantities here. We have uh, and stress quantities. We have this translational strain measurement. This is the uh, uh, rotation per unit uh, Length. Uh, so let's say it, it, it may, uh, for example, uh, represent to you quantities as curvature and torsion, for example. Then you can describe, describe all of them together in a single uh, general strain vector and define its counterpart stress quantities. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, as I said, I will not go into details here. And also a very simple constitutive equation is not this, the only way to do that. This is a linear constitutive equation. You can have more enhanced schemes with hyperelastic materials more. Uh, actually, this one is, is associated with a quadratic uh, potential and a very uh, simple scheme. You can have much more, uh, let's say, uh, complex uh, schemes to handle the constitutive equation with arbitrary uh, hyperelastic materials, for example, and so on. So. Just as a brief, and if you want to have a look afterwards in the more detail in these formulations, I suggest you to have a look at the CMOS and then the works. This is uh, only one of them that I'm uh, here referring to, but the, the, actually there are many uh, very nice articles you can find from CMOS and co-workers. And also Professor Pimenta's works and Campello. Actually, they have also many nice uh, references on these things, so you can find here some of them. I suggest to have a look. And one uh, recent one that I, uh, I did uh, in applications for offshore risers using this formulation, for example. So you can have a look. And uh, when you want to make a uh, finite element using this, what you have to do is quite simple. You have to, it's a standard finite element. You have to establish some displacement fields, uh, some, some actually, uh, sorry, for, uh, some displacement fields, U and uh, alpha. This is the displacement and the rotation fields. Use standard uh, Lagrangian uh, shape functions to do that. So uh, this is nothing more than usual things. Uh, of course, there may be some tricks to 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 find to 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 choose the, the, the degree of this function and so on. But I will not enter in this discussion here because the, the talk here is about contact, not about details of finite elements on these things. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, uh, um, next I uh, will show briefly also the, the geometrically exact shell model. Actually, this uh, comes from the works of also from the Pimenta and Campello, University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. And uh, it's quite similar idea from the, the, the previous uh, the, uh, discussion about the beam. But here you have a reference configurations that will be your shell at the format configuration arbitrarily. You can find you can define here a vector AR, which is called the shell director, and uh, it's initially initially orthogonal to reference configuration, but afterwards uh, this is a kind of uh, highs and middling uh, theory, so you don't have uh, necessarily orthogonality between this uh, vector in the deformed configuration and, uh, and between the this, the deformed let's say average surface of the of the shell and the vector uh, A. I plus one here at the, the format configuration. So, uh, yeah, so we define some 
some kinematics here as well. So we can define some vectors at the reference configuration. This guy here, the, it's a theta vector here, plus this guy, it's called to this, to this C value here and so on. As I said, the shell director may experience general movements. Then in order to describe such general movements, we use the, also the rotation tensor as we did in the previous, in the beam uh, formulation in that time, the, let's say our, our rotation was to, 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 let's say, to rotate a given vector associated with a, with a cross-section in order to describe which the rotation of a given cross-section of the beam. At this time, is not the case. Here, we are interested in describing the rotation of this shell uh, director. So with that, we establish all the kinematics, Gramito fields again, generalized strain quantities, similarly way to the, to the, as we did for the beam, and stress quantities and so on. With that, again, constitutive equation in this case, I'm, I'm here just putting a very simple one, but as I said, you can also handle with much more complex schemes with general hyperelastic materials. And here are the basic references for you to go deeper in this thing. So it's Campello, the, there is the Shao guy, so the, the and uh, also Professor Pimenta. Uh, probably. Professor Picampillo and Professor Pimenta are my colleagues in the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. And of course, Professor Vigas is from the University of Hanover, uh, uh, Germany. And yeah, there are some nice works here that you can have a look. But I think I've heard a chat uh, sound, so I'll have a look. You probably have some questions. Just prior to go there, I'll come. I think there was a question. Yes, let me have a look. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, are large strain permitted in GEBT? What's GEBT? Just let me know. Who asked it? Uh, what, what do you mean with GEBT? Geometrically exact being theory, is it? Yeah, I'm guessing so. That's what I'm guessing. Okay. I see, I see, I see, I see. Thanks. Uh, yes, it's permitted, definitely. Uh, further, does large strain mean large displacements? No, uh, you can have large displacements, but uh, not necessarily large strains. You can, uh, have, for example, usually when we talk about, uh, for example, uh, usually when, when you use this uh, constitutive equation I've been showing here, where you are interested in small strains, for example, but you can have uh, arbitrary large displacements and also finite rotations, large, large rotations. This is not a problem. Uh, but when you're talking about strains, actually they are not, uh, if you, uh, in this case I'm showing here, they are not uh, large strains. Okay. But uh, you can handle large strains, yes. But in that case, I would go for more uh, complex uh, hyperelastic schemes for uh, material modeling. Is, is, that, is that clear? Please let me know. Okay. So, uh, yeah, here an example of Shao Dom, for example, and uh, here the, the clever choice of some uh, functions, quadratic shape functions for displacement, linear shape functions for rotations. You can establish triangular Shao elements, for example, here in a very nice way and combining this degrees of freedom of displacement rotation. And so we have a kind of riser mean shell, as I, as I said. Okay, finally I'll go now into multi-body systems to finally introduce contact. Uh, so here you have some pictures showing us uh, some interesting systems uh, made by man. And the, these are from the nature. Uh, and um, yeah, so we can have, for example, modeling of flexible bodies here, for example, together with rigid bodies. And uh, the bird is quite, uh, it's quite beautiful bird I show here because actually if you think of our, ourselves and the animals and all, all the things in nature, uh, actually uh, we, we may think of this, for example, with this bird as a very complex uh, multi-body system full of joints and uh, as our body, for example. So uh, it's, uh, it's a nice way to think of a multi-body system. You have a multi-body system uh, in ourselves and in animals, in nature, everything. So, yeah, to introduce you multi-body systems, 
next, uh, I would like to, to, to ask you to have a look at this box here. So we, we understand that a multi-body system uh, uh, as a set of bodies, let's say these bodies are maybe rigid or flexible, doesn't matter at, at this time. So imagine that you have no interaction between them at the first moment. So this F uh, I J here is the force interaction between the bodies. So at this at the moment, I'm assuming that they are all all, all these forces are zero. If you come to this interaction, uh, no zero interaction, uh, you, you you can have something more complex. But if you don't have this interaction, you can write for every ball here for every. Let's say the Newton laws, and then you can solve the dynamics of all of them. That's a, a, a very simple thing, because all of all of them are completely uncoupled with the other ones, because you don't have interaction between them. On the other hand, if you have some interaction forces between these uh, particles that are generally uh, non-zero, then you have to somehow uh, tell your system how are how are these interactions uh, taking place actually. So. You need some constraints, for example, that may rule the interactions and also they may, may rule how these forces are changed between these particles. For doing that, uh, you can come and uh, try to write the weak form for a system of independent flexible bodies, uh, prior, uh, yet independent, not yet coupled. So, you, for example, thinking of the, the, you can write that uh, uh, weak form I showed at the beginning for one. Uh, for one ball to the other ball, imagine that we have two only. And uh, the virtual quantities here, the test function that I, I presented previously, are also uh, here completely independent. So, uh, because uh, bodies do not interact. So, they are arbitrary for each body. So, you can also, uh, let's see, this is zero, this is zero as well. These guys are independent. You can just sum up all these equations for, for one body, for the other one, both are equal to zero. These guys are independent, arbitrary fields. So you can here uh, write everything as a single equation. That's the, that's the weak form of the system. Just summing up all the quantities for, for all these uh, particles. Then let's say that we have, a, uh, let's say, a simple uh, uh, con constraint between bodies. Imagine that we have two glued bodies. So we have a glued body BA, glued with BB. And you have this gamma C region here, which is, the, let's say, the region where the bodies are glued. So the region where we have some kind of interaction. Here I put apart both bodies on each other here just to show, let's say, the, 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 the traction here in the region of the contact that we have here in this glued region. Here. And this field here is, is a, a kind of, uh, let's say, a surface uh, load that we can think as a Neumann boundary. Very similar to a Neumann boundary if you, if you think of each body separately. So uh, that's the idea. So this contact traction, this may be seen as, as I said, as a part of Neumann boundary for each one of the bodies. If we see this as a part of Neumann body, let's say that we'd like to imagine this thing has an uh, external load. So if you keep this minus sign here, just write this right-hand side of this equation here as, as part of, let's say, if, if it was a part of this external loads for in this body, external loads in this body with minus at the front here, as I said, as I write here. So I have it for body A here, for body B, this here. But you have locally the action reaction principle that uh, is true. So you have this uh, for each pair of material points here exactly. You have this uh, opposite sign for this uh, traction uh, at this uh, region of uh, for each pair of material points. So you can uh, rewrite previously uh, the previous equation here. For example, uh, just uh, naming. Let's say that let's let's write as of everything as a function of TCB, for example. We can just write from uh, so we can put together the, since uh, this gamma C region in A and B are the same actually because they both interact. Uh, you have it, uh, you can write for the, the up for the bottom body, so you can write everything as a single integral here and put uh, here is. TCB uh, as a traction uh, force body body B. You, call, you just uh, to simplify notations, we call it as TC, for example, with the traction change in between bodies in this contact region. And here naturally appears this uh, 
this uh, virtual displacement here in body A minus the virtual displacement in body B. That's interesting because uh, naturally this uh, one minus the other one naturally appears here, and this came actually from the actual reaction principle. So this, let's say, starts to be something, uh, a way to, to, to tell us uh, something about a, uh, what we will call in the future a gap quantity, which is a local kinematic measurement related to the distance between a pair of material body, a material points in both bodies, okay? I'll go deeper that in the future. But by now, please keep in mind this equation. We can see this interaction between two glued bodies as when we look at this as a contribution due to external loads with a minus here in the front as something that's a contact traction times this subtraction here okay please keep this in mind we come back to that in near future now let's think of this same problem but in a different way let's think this blue bars as a mechanical constraint not no longer thinking of the let's say, Neumann boundary and just seeing the, the loads. But let's look at the, 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 from the kinematic point of view. We have a mechanical constraint. So the, the displacement fields are no longer independent in, the, in, the, in that region that we have contact. So what we can do here, we can define a gap quantity, which is what this is very important quantity in contact mechanics. We define the gap as um, let's say this is the called master slave procedure what what is what is exactly this uh, we, we choose let's say that we choose a material point in one of the bodies let's say this gamma a body and we project this point here in order to find which the one that the counterpart of this material point in the other one so actually why that to find which the material point in the other body that will really be the the one that will talk to the one in the top body. So contact mechanics is always like this. We have some, let's say, brothers, some, some material points, brothers, let's say, in the, in the one body and the other one. So if you, if you look briefly here, I can just show you as something like this. Imagine that you have one body here, and let's say, imagine that we have contact here. They are putting a little apart among each other just to see. But let's imagine that you have this, guy and this guy these are the, the brothers that i said the, and the neighbor ones let's see we have another ones here another body uh, brothers and so on so uh, you have infinite brothers let's say one in one uh, body and another one in the other one so here uh, the master slave procedure is basically one uh, a way to do such a thing you choose one guy here and you would like to see uh, and to, to ask and uh, who is who is your brother is this guy here? So master slave procedure gives you the answer to who is my brother here from this point? Who is the brother of it in the other body? That's the idea. So this is important because actually um, this let's say brother that I'm joking here with you. Uh, this will be the one that uh, will be used to define all the kinematics with respect to this pair of material points. Uh, presenting contact here. Of course, uh, all the drawings here, uh, the bodies are uh, on the surface are putting apart on each other just to show things. Otherwise, you cannot see the, these quantities I'm showing here. Okay, so imagine that we define a vector quantity as this one. And uh, yeah, and we start now from the potential. Imagine that we have a potential. This is something that is quite uh, usual. Uh, probably you have heard about the Lagrange multiplier schemes in order to, in, to prescribe some kind of constraint in general mechanical systems. So imagine that you have an integral over the entire contact surface. You have this vector field of Lagrange multipliers times this gap quantity, which I would like to, to say that's always zero because we are talking about fluid bodies here. So e every neighbor points, they should not have relative displacement between them. So this gap has to be zero. That's what we are going to impose to prescribe here. If we, make, uh, if we evaluate the first variation of this potential, 
we have actually what we call the contact contribution to the weak form of the model. So since we have introduced here this, uh, uh, multi this Lagrange multiplier here, we have this variation of this guy times this plus this uh, Lagrange multiplier times variation of this gap. If you will look at this equation, this equation is quite similar uh, part of it to the, to the previous slide one. Why that? Look at this gap. Evaluate it, its, its uh, variation. So you have to see uh, let's say, uh, which, the, which the quantities here depend on the displacements, on the degrees of freedom of the problem. So actually the variation of the gap here is, can, be, can, can be written as uh, this way. Here. Yeah? But we have an additional term here that comes from the constraint equation itself. So this equation uh, may be in, understood as it's a constraint enforcement since we have this new variable here and this uh, variation of this variable, it's an arbitrary field. So in order, we, we, we will we'll need the, uh, after we have to, we will sum this uh, contribution to the weak form of the model. So we, we would like to have a zero quantity at the end. Uh, uh, when we include all the forces, the, uh, the internal forces, external forces, and so on. By now, we have this quantity here that's the, the constraint enforcement term plus this one that's okay. We would like to constrain the, the model with the gap zero. Okay, you have to pay the price for it. What's the price for having that constraint? You have to, this Lagrange multiplier times something, times your, let's say, this quantity here has to be added. And if you look at this quantity, this lambda here is there exactly the, the same of TC of my previous slide. If I come back, look at the term again, look at this term of the equation. It's exactly this second one here. But not only that, but we have, so uh, the introduction of this first term here that's in order to introduce the constraint force. Yeah, so uh, that's the, the basic idea of contact, how to, how to include that in the module. So you have another contribution in your weak form and uh, that coming from these uh, contributions actually from a mechanical constraint. Yeah, and if you want to, to let's say, uh, now generalize such idea to make, create a residual, function, scalar function here, including all the internal forces, all the, the, the kinematic contributions for a set of any bodies with external loads and many contacts and everything you want as an extra contribution here, you can just sum up all these quantities. And this thing is actually to be a nice way to construct the model equations in order to permit, let's say, a softer modularization. So uh, actually, we may see this, all these as many blocks that you put together in your system and you, you are summing up some contributions and then you have a complete full multibody system with full of constraints, full of joints, uh, what we'd like to include in, on it. Yeah, and the solution of this set of nonlinear equations may be given by the, we have to, you have to have this uh, residual equals to zero. So for that, you have to make a discretization, discretization in space. Usually, when you have, for example, flexible bodies, you can then use the geometrical exacting theory and the, or shell theories and or even the finite element for solids and whatever. And discretization a long time in order to have a time, uh, uh, time, uh, time evolution of your system. Yeah. Okay, so that's what we do. Usually, uh, when you discretize in space, this uh, then you this initial scalar residual, you have to write uh, rewrite it as a function of the degrees of freedom of the of, of your system for arbitrary uh, virtual quantities. So you 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 here you come up with a set of uh, uh, let's say the number of degrees of freedom of the system equations that you have to, to equal to zero. And in order to solve it, usually you use the newton hobson method or other schemes. So for that, you need the, the, let's say, the consistent linearization of this. We call it the, the constant linearization of the weak form. That's given by all these contributions here. So to, to evaluate this, it's all algebraic stuff, uh, algebraic work, which, which can be really complex to be done. But fortunately, today we have some schemes to, to make that automatically. For example, using nascent software or other schemes 
that provides us, for example, automatic differentiation techniques and so on. So it's quite a clever way to do that. Okay, I will come stop for a second to see if you have some questions. Yeah. So far, no contact term in week four, right? Shantanu asked me at, uh, yeah, some, some minutes, some time. Uh, yeah, but now we have uh, Shantanu. Is it clear? Okay. So that's it. Some more question by now? Yeah. So now, now we, finally we, we came to the contact part. Yeah, I'm going a little slower than I would like to, sorry. <laughs> I think, uh, uh, yeah, but uh, let's see until well, when, uh, where we can go here. So what about contact constraints themselves? So uh, let's say all the discussion I've been doing so far for you to explain you the, let's say, the origin of that kind of contact contribution term in the weak form. Now, uh, it was done for the glued bodies. That's actually something not, not as complex as the contact constraint, because glued bodies, you, you already know from the beginning where is the glued region, for example, okay? You know that this gamma C region from the beginning, but when you have a, actually a contact constraint, the, the point is that this region is unknown. You don't have that such a knowledge from the beginning, usually. And what you have to do, you have to search for these contact regions, and you have actual inequality constraints. So you have to define in that similar way the glued bodies, uh, what the difference between this, let's say, let's skip in the, let's say the idea of the master slave scheme that I presented you previously, times the, there's the normal direction, that's the normal, for example, this body B here, we call the master body. So this inequality has to, to hold all the time. So that's the contact constraint. So it's not an equality constraint, but it's an inequality constraint, actually. So, okay, we can, so, do the same procedure that I explained already of this uh, master slave problem. We call this, uh, here it's more detailed, so what we do, we elect slave bodies in one body, is, is, is slave points in one body, let's say it's gamma A here. The term, it's co their counterpart, or what they call uh, their neighbors in the other one. And how we do that? Well, we do that by assuming some, uh, what do we call here, orthogonality conditions, what means that actually it's a orthogonal projection, which geometrically here shown by this, this uh, condition that's uh, written here, this, uh, that's depicted in this figure. Uh, evaluation of this problem, I call it the LCP, that's, I call it the local contact problem, yeah? And after that, we evaluate the gap here. We can evaluate this gap here, and we can see if this gap here, for example, this, uh, this dot product here, is a positive or is a negative quantity. And based on that, this can be used as a flag to decide if we have or not the contact constraint obeyed or disobeyed. And based on that, we have to include or not, but let's say, the, the uh, contact contributions in our weak form. So that's the basic idea. The inequality constraint here comes as an if, an, an if in a code, let's say. You have to test something, and based on that test, you have to include or not a contribution to the weak form. So actually, this, this is interesting because you can see this, even if you were working in the linear elasticity range, for example, due to the fact that you have this if, and you don't know from beginning where the material points that are presenting contact or not, even with that, you have a non-linearity in this kind of system because of this if, because you don't know from beginning where is the region of contact, even in, in a linear elasticity. That's quite interesting. Yeah, this can be written in a fashion that's uh, usually uh, done uh, with the optimization uh, uh, community. It's called uh, KKT uh, conditions, Karish Q Tucker condition. So we can uh, write this. So I have this, this quantity, this normal gap has to be larger than zero. So this contact pressure, let's say that that's the interpretation of this, that 
the normal part of that contact uh, traction that I said you, so if you take the magnitude here, it has to be larger uh, or equal to zero, and this product also holds, okay? The uh, Gn times Pn equal to zero on gamma C. That's the region where contact uh, takes place. That's the KKT uh, condition. That's really, uh, the, uh, that's the way that usually you, you find in textbooks of contact uh, mechanics in order to, to define, let's say, the, the problem itself. Yeah, then the, uh, you can have what we call sticking condition. Sticking condition, yes, we can see, sticking condition means that we don't have sliding, okay? Imagine that you have uh, the contact and uh, as, uh, let's say, uh, similar to the glued bodies condition, but it's a glued body condition that you can put one body apart each other if they uh, want to go apart each other. You don't have actually a adhesion forces that keep them uh, uh, stuck, sticking together if you try to put them apart each other. You don't have that effect here. So, but since you have contact, no one more slides on the other one, okay? That's the sticking condition that we can uh, describe here. This is uh, quite similar, as I said, to the glued boards. We, we can define a single quantity, a vector quantity G, and include in the weak form like this, as exactly I did previously. And, uh, but just to, to let's say, this, uh, just to make a geometric decomposition of this uh, problem here, you can just uh, split these terms in two parts. For example, this um, Lagrange multiplier here, you, you put a, an, a scalar part of it times Gn, that's the normal contribution, plus the, the another one with the tangential contribution. You can split as you want, so you, you make this decomposition here, just do that. And you have these two contributions that have, we've been discussing so far already. So uh, let's see that. Now the, we may uh, reinterpret this guy here. Of course, this, uh, this will be the... The, 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 this, this scalar here will be the contact pressure, and this guy here will be the shear stress of the interface due to this decomposition that we did. And uh, you have an, another quantity here, it's, it's defined here, it's GT here, it's called the tangential gap quantity. That's the, let's see, the sliding amount measurement. But in this case, you don't have the sliding. So actually, that's why this guy has to be zero, okay? And, but afterwards, this the same uh, GT here will appear as something that can, uh, can sometimes be non-zero as well when we have the sliding condition. That's the, my next uh, discussion. And the variation of this uh, GT here, which may be seen as a measure of a sliding tendency. What I, what I mean, uh, the bodies do not slide the direct, of course, because we have a sticking condition, but um, as uh, in a condition that we'd like to slide, wh where's, what's this direction of sliding tendency, let's say. So that's uh, the, the idea of this variation. Okay. Um, when we have sliding, actually, you, what is sliding? So uh, you come back here to this slide. So this is the constraint equations, as I said to you. So this is the normal constraint. You don't, do not permit penetration. So this is doing this is this has been doing this term, and this is uh, been doing this term. That's the that's the sticking condition that we don't allow any sliding. When you would like to have a sliding, what you do? You alleviate this condition. Just drop this term out of the equation, and reinterpret the, this other one. That's no longer uh, let's say the the the, the, the this Lagrange multiplier that come from this constraint, but these are going to be, instead, friction shear stress, where we have actually friction, we have friction force. So we reinterpret this equation, just dropping the first term here and reinterpreting the second one. So that's quite a straightforward way to understand the difference between them, in my opinion. Okay, and how to evaluate this uh, friction shear stress? This can be really complicated, but uh, you can use Coulomb friction, for example. It's always a relation between the normal and tangential force, usually. And you have, for example, in Rieger's book, you have some examples here in this figure. And actually, what do you need? You need uh, to establish a tangential constitutive contact law in order to have uh, a way to evaluate this, uh, 
this uh, shear stress here when you have friction. That's what you do. Yeah. So, this is the idea. Okay, uh, then coming to the, let's say, more familiar parts of uh, how to manage that infinite element environments. So, usually what you do is to have node-to-node -node formulations. Usually this is the simplest approach that you have. So, if you look at 70s, a uh, long time ago, we have already some uh, codes, uh, finite element codes, already with this kind of formulation for contacts. Usually it's limited for small deformation because actually what's the, the idea of these node-to-node -node formulations? You do not solve the local contact problem that I, tell, I told you previously. You just assume from beginning which are the neighbor points, which are the points that are going to interact between surfaces in contact. So, uh, okay, you can do that. But usually you can do that only when you have, for example, matching meshes in both bodies that are touching their cells. So you have, let's say, the neighbors directly defined in that uh, case. Uh, but you if you have a large displacement experience, for example, then this usually cannot be uh, used anymore. Uh, only if you have some special strategies to update such a kind of schemes. But not the, this is not exactly the, the idea of these first formulations that I'm, I'm showing here. Okay, you also have what we call no to surface formulations. Uh, the literature also calls it no to segment approach. You can find many interesting papers from uh, Professor Vliegers and Professor Zavarisi, for example, that uh, discuss this kind of, uh, of topics. Uh, basically, what you have you, is the master slave directly here. So you choose from beginning some nodes in one body as slave bodies, as slave points, and you try to find their neighbors in the other one by the orthogonal projection here. So you can, this is called the master slave scheme or node to, to surface schemes. This is quite usual. And uh, finally, the, the more enhanced schemes other to, to, that may be used as well is called surface-to-surface -surface formulations. Uh, the, the, the idea here is to establish contact constraints in a weak sense. What I mean, you have, for example, of course, you have, the, the, would like to, to imagine that equation that I showed at the beginning. So it, it's over the, in an integral over the entire contact surface here. Okay, uh, so what you have to do is to evaluate somehow both a, a Lagrange multipliers field and also a gap field. What you do, you can have special strategies in order to, let's say, you choose slave, uh, slave points as, for example, this uh, surface as the integration points here, for example, from this integral. You can evaluate the gap for each one. And then you can use some very clever and uh, special strategies in order to establish, for example, this uh, Lagrange multipliers field. And, for example, then you can define uh, schemes like the Mortar method, for example. Then uh, you can have a look at, for example, Alexander Pop's works that are quite nice in this field. Uh, yeah, so, uh, for example, and also there's an interesting one implementation from Fisher and Briggers, for example. If you have a look at the Professor Briggers' book, uh, yeah, there's a mention for, for this uh, kind of a strategy. You can find some more details on that there. Yeah. And finally, the, the that of my presentation is pointwise contact. So uh, you have, when you have a contact pointwise interaction, what is this? It's a very particular scenario where you have your term of contact. It's an integral over the entire contact surface. But when this surface is small, Almost, uh, let's say, uh, small when compared to the to, let's say, to the size of the of the surface of the body there. So, you can approximate its integral by let's say the value evaluate uh, as an average value of uh, uh, let's say this area of the surface here times all the integrand here. So instead of making uh, actually the integral, you replace this by this uh, let's say average values here. So this is a strategy we can do in many kinds of problems. Um, but the question is how to elect the pair of contact points, what I'm calling neighbors, can they, can they to contact? We can keep the master-slave choice. Yeah, it's a possibility. 
Then we, uh, what you do is choose, uh, let's see, one slave point in one body and make the projection in the other one. And then these are the neighbor guys. But the idea that we introduced it, uh, actually, we did not introduce exactly this idea. This idea, from, my, from the best of my knowledge, uh, came from the idea of a, a paper from 1997, Professor Vriges and Zavarisi for contact between beings, where they present, let's say, a scheme that you have two beings uh, that make spirits contact, and instead of defining as late body and master surface and so on, they define both beings as masters master, let's say, curves in space, and try to find the, 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 the geometric problem of minimum distance between these uh, beings. And based on that solution, then they come, uh, let's say, to say, okay, this is our uh, contact point candidate. And that's the idea. And then the formation comes in the sequence. So we thought that, oh, okay, why not to do the same idea but uh, using two surfaces directly so we keep four unknowns in this let's say local contact problem and manage all the problem from beginning using and keeping this four unknowns and uh, sometimes we elevate this four unknowns to we degenerate this local contact problem to less unknowns but let's say all based on the four unknown problems that's the that's uh, the basic idea for the master master method where we do not have a priori and a slave point. Okay, so that's the big difference. So the big difference between master slave and master master is the make board's choice. In the master slave technique, we choose, we pick at the beginning one material point and try to find its neck board in the other body. In the master master scheme, this is not the case. We do not know any one of the neighbors at the beginning, we try to find directly mathematically by the local quantum problems, which are the more prone neighbors that we uh, would like to have contact instead of choosing a priori one of the neighbors. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me see just if we have some question. Yeah. Sorry, I'm a little late here. <laughs> the question was about uh, 40 minutes ago. What will this, the, this uh, uh, Anshu asked it, what means the, here, the, this, uh, this means penetration Anshu, what you asked here. So this is the, the what we cannot, uh, this is the condition that when you have this, uh, neg uh, this negative sign, the right hand side of, of this inequality you put here, means that we have penetration and they, that we have to activate our contact, uh, let's say, uh, schemes to, to avoid the penetration, actually. Then you have many schemes to, to, let's say, to do that. You can use the Lagrange multipliers or you can use penalty methods, for example, that I've been using on, on my work, and uh, that's quite nice as well. But you can uh, have other choices. OK, uh, it's clear. Is it clear, Ashul? Yeah, that's true. So we have to avoid penetration always because penetrations are not are not physics. Actually, you cannot have it. So that's the idea. Uh, we introduce the constraint equations in our system to avoid penetrations. Yeah. Okay. Welcome. Now going to be to be in contact. So uh, what do we have here? Imagine that we have two beans described by uh, here this uh, uh, the bean axis here in one body in the other one. I call it gamma a and gamma b. This uh, zeta a and zeta b are the uh, what we call convective coordinates that describe this uh, dot line dotted line here describing the bean center line. Okay. You have also the radii r a and r b of both. And, uh, and usually, when you have non-parallel or non-conformal beams, this uh, may be seen as a nice way to, to define a contact point-wise interaction that, I, uh, as I said, proposed by this paper of the Zavadis in, uh, in Briggers 1997. Yeah, then uh, we start here, we did some implementation of this in Giraffe, and I will show you some examples afterwards. So based on the idea that I discussed it so far, 
in uh, 2014, we started the project the University of Sao Paulo um, in Brazil. That's called Giraffe Project. The idea of this project is, okay, let's try to make our own finite element code. Uh, but it's not, a, let's say, uh, the, the idea is to be a generic interface, uh, what I call giraffe here, generic interface readily accessible for finite elements. This interface has the objective of being, uh, let's say, a platform where researchers can implement their own finite element formulations, their own contact uh, formulations, already taking advantage of many resources uh, done in the past by other researchers in this same platform. So what we have so far by now, it's, uh, uh, okay, we have many resources already uh, in, uh, implemented, such as geometrically, uh, geometrically exact beans, shells, spring, dash pot elements, rigid body, many kinds of joints, for such as hinge, universal, spherical, translational, rigid node set, and so on. With that, we can uh, set up many systems to solve, many mechanical systems. We have environment loads defined, we have some contact constraints already defined as well. And the idea uh, of uh, coding Giraffe is that it provides a modularization because it's all, uh, everything is object-oriented and uh, guided. So we try to, to make the things as modular as possible. And uh, also, we were, we've been working with AceGen together with Giraffe. So what we do, AceGen is a plugin for Mathematica. It's developed at the University of uh, Ljubljana by Professor Joseph Korelch. It's uh, referenced in the book Automati Automation of Finite Element Method by uh, Professor Korelch and Professor Briggers. Uh, AceGen is a plugin that so uh, the, you, you enter a code uh, and it basically gives you the automatic differentiation and also of that code uh, with respect to some variables that you can define. And also it uh, makes you, uh, let's say, a code, an optimized code. And you can export that code in many languages, such as C++, such as Fortran and others. So it's quite convenient. We can, um, let's say, make our own platform as we are doing, as Giraffe, it's called in C++. And uh, use this gen and uh, this uh, framework, its framework in order to generate automatically some parts of code uh, to make things easier. Okay, so that's the basic idea. And uh, what I will show by now in the, in the rest of my presentation will be much, let's say, more uh, to, to show some examples and uh, how is the master master managing some kind of contacts. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, uh, but contact has also something important, that uh, the global search. All I mentioned by now, I assume it somehow that I, we know from beginning where is a region, let's say, prone to have contact interaction. If we don't know that, it can be a problem. You don't know uh, where to choose, where to, where to, let's say, to look for contact. So usually you need a global rough search scheme in order to find, uh, let's say, uh, regions that are really strong candidate to contact. Otherwise, we are just uh, be searching all in, the, in the entire surface and you have nothing more. And you can lose a lot of time for that. So usually Giraffe does what almost every uh, software do, uh, do, uh, does for that. The global search based on simple things. For example, can use balls, uh, spheres, Overlapping for doing that for each region of your uh, of your uh, mesh, when you think of uh, finite limit meshes, for example, or you can also think of more enhanced schemes, for example, with uh, bounding volumes uh, of different shapes, not only spheres but boxes and uh, other stuff. And the idea here is to let's say pre-eliminate contact pairs that will not take place, or that we assume that they're not prone to take place. So we can uh, split the contacts between eligible and non-eligible, and also for afterwards, for each decision, you can uh, uh, can elect some balls, for example, and look for overlaps between them. And if you have the overlap between them, then that's it. We have to look at uh, with more attention to these uh, contacts. So then we go finally and pay the price for looking for it because it's uh, it's something that. Uh, Cause of our attention due to proximity of the body. So that's why. 
On the other hand, if the balls do not overlap, for example, you, you say, okay, these guys are not important. We just let them there and ignore them, okay? Sometimes you have to verify if you were correct or not. You can do that at the end, for example, of a step of simulation. Okay, uh, okay, of course, the success of such strategy depends a lot on the size of the spheres, in this case, or the size of the bonding volumes you use in a general and more broad scheme. But, uh, yeah, this is sometimes uh, not straightforward. But I will not go into this uh, discussion right now, but just keep in mind this, that we need to have a global search scheme a priori. Then, finally, since we have this these candidates, we have eligible pairs that we can uh, do that. Then we go to the LCP, the local contact problem, for example, master slave schemes or the master master schemes. And after that, we decide if we have or not penetration. So this decision can be made uh, looking at the, at the flag that I mentioned, that's the, the dot, the, usually the dot product flag that gives, this, uh, gives us this answer. So you, you need to find a way if you, if you have a penetration or not between bodies. And if you have penetration, you cannot, you cannot, you cannot handle, you have, to, you have to, to not permit it, so you, then you activate contact contribution. So on the other hand, if you don't have penetration, just let it, and do not include anything in your weak form with respect to that specific uh, contact pair. Okay. Uh, so the LCP is quite important, this local contact problem. And then the master-master schemes uh, for doing this kind of LCP. I will do the following. I'll, I'll just give a small uh, view of the master-master the master schemes. Then I will show you some examples of this. And then uh, I think I will stop because otherwise I will go really, really further. It may will, it will not be convenient. And uh, to go uh, because probably all of us will get tired. Uh, but I will let this material with you so you can go more uh, deeply if you want in the, in the references. Uh, and of course, you can uh, get in contact with me if you have some question or some curiosity and so on. We can share with this. Okay, so just this uh, as the final topic here. So, how to handle the master master contact formulation between two surfaces? Yeah, uh, the idea is to do so to define, as I said, two surfaces. We have this convective coordinates here in this uh, zeta a, the, the, the theta a, uh, zeta b, theta b here in both. So we can define, let's see, a, a single convective coordinates vector here, describe it. And both both surfaces may be seen as a, uh, as dependent of this their own convective vector. So imagine that you would like to locate a material point here. What does it depend uh, on? Depends on the choice of the coordinates that you choose, of course, to to locate a point here in the surface. But depends also on how this surface is parameterized. What does parameterization depends on? For example, imagine that you have a flexible body. You have nodes, for example, that rule somehow how this surface is traveling in space along the model evolution. So, for example, we have to define this parameterization as a function of degrees of freedom of this, uh, of this, uh, let's say, the, of this mesh, local mesh, for example. If you want to use the mesh directly as something to parameterize your surface, for example, yeah? So it generally depends, so each one of the surface generally depends on also, not only the, their convective coordinates, but also the degrees of freedom that rule its own parameterization, in this case dA, in this case dB, okay? And the basic quantity of the master-master contact formulation is the gap uh, vector G, it, it, which is defined in a simple way. It's simply point in surface, a general point in surface A minus a, a general point in surface B. It's represented here in this uh, picture, where you can see this uh, gap vector. So it's a uh, vector uh, defined this way. Yeah. After, uh, how can we define the local contact problem for the master-master scheme? It's quite, uh, it's quite a simple way. What do you do? You clan 
for orthogonality conditions. You say that your gap has to be orthogonal to derivative gamma a with respect to, uh, to zeta a and uh, gamma a with respect to uh, theta a. What this means, these are the tangent factors in the gamma a surface here in a given point. So you say that your gap has to be orthogonal to both tangent directions in the surface gamma a. And you also say the same for the surface gamma b. So you say this, this minus here comes in the future, by now you could also define this without the minus here. But I introduced the minus here uh, in, the, in the last works because then we can relate this with uh, an optimization problem, which is more, uh, let's say, an elegant way to formalize these things, okay? That's why we put the minus here. Yeah, but there's are, 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 let's say, four equation problem. It's an optimization problem, but actually, given a frozen, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, configuration of both surfaces where you have gamma a and gamma b one and the other one you can uh, directly let's say define uh, these four equations here and try to find which are the convective coordinate values that gives you a solution for this problem it's a nonlinear problem generally okay and also, of course, it's not quite straightforward always. For example, you can you can have some situations that you don't have convexity, for example, here. You can have more than one solution, okay? So you have to, 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 to manage that in a clever way in order to try to have always convexity, at least locally, in order to have a good way to find the solution and then to go, uh, to go further with your contact method. Okay, so imagine that we have all these, let's say, Surface is smooth, everything perfect, okay? So, and it's uh, convex and so on. Then you can find a solution. And then, since you, you know the solution, then you define, that's it, that, then you can have the test in order to have, see if you have penetration or not. In case you have penetration, for example, then you come, you say, okay, we have penetration, we cannot uh, permit it, so we need to include some uh, contribution in the model. So here, it's a simple way to, to include a, a potential that after we come to the a, a potential due to contact, uh, when you have penetration, so we define this based on the gap quantity, and here it's defined using the penalty approach. This epsilon n here is, a, it's called our the penalty quantity. It may be understood, let's say, as a spring, a very, usually a very strong spring, that you permit a little contact and you you uh, you compress more and more your spring as long as you have more penetration, for example. So that's a way to avoid penetration by a uh, we can interpret it mechanically as a spring in the contact uh, region. So we do that, then we find then many algebraic work. We find the variation, so we have a contribution to the weak form. We need this term that can be uh, evaluated by mathematics and HGN and so on. Then I will skip a little this, because this is a discussion that I think is not important by now, but I will let the material with you. So the, 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 the relation between the, the variation of, uh, with respect to the convective coordinates and the degrees of freedom, this is something not very straightforward. I'll let this for, for the opportunity. Yes, and but the important thing is that let's say uh, after some algebraic work, you can find that uh, uh, you have a relation, uh, an operator, what I call d here, which gives you a relation between the variation of the convective coordinates and the degrees of freedom of your model. This depends all on the parameterization of your surface. This is a geometric operator actually, yeah, that comes from the variation. Okay, so we need uh, to go for it uh, afterwards. And okay, this, uh, let's see, at least I give you the, 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 let's say the basic idea of how to manage the, the normal contribution in master's master ma methods. But, but now, if you'd like to have the, let's say, okay, how to manage the tangential kinematics and friction and so on. Okay, we can think of the same thing, but now for the tangential part, how to manage that? Then, if you look at the master slave scheme that uh, here uh, briefly present, we have the, the slave points on red here in one body. Let's say that we take an, a given slave point and just project it onto the master surface. Then, uh, of course, uh, 
how to, to, to trade this uh, the friction here, you have to track the movement of this uh, red point here on this surface here. And as long as you have the history of the movement of this point on the surface, you know how to evaluate the friction and how to, yeah, that's the idea. So the friction is uh, when you have sliding for it, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's dependent on the trajectory of this point on the surface of the sliding. Okay, and if you have sticky, you can test for sticking if you uh, have or not sliding, uh, have or not uh, sticky. Um, yeah, uh, by for example, using a, a tangential penalty approach, it's a way to do that. Okay, but the problem is that in master master scheme, the, you, we don't have uh, such a way to, to from, from the beginning have the already slave point here, and let's say study how this. Uh, movement can take place on or why it was lighting on the other surface. So we don't have that. And then uh, this can be an issue, for example. Uh, so it's not possible to lack the, in the master-master scheme a single slave point and project in the master surface and directly study how it's the movement. So what do we have to do? So the discussion started on the, this paper where we define the a new we redefine the tangential gap quantity uh, from a scenario of rolling of beams on flat surfaces. So this the idea is quite simple. Imagine that we would like to measure somehow the amount of sliding of a body on the other one. That's the, what we need to try to evaluate friction somehow. So imagine to have pure sliding of a cylinder over a flat surface. So you have this material point taking contact here and this sliding on, until here. So we have the gap. So we have this sliding amount, this quantity here, from here to here. That's the sliding amount. But now imagine that you have sliding, but you will have some also rolling here. So actually, when you have rolling, for example, uh, let's say that the, the point, uh, this point, after some rolling, it rolled, uh, so this point comes to this position. So if you want to, to quantify somehow this lighting amount here, you have actually this delta S here, this quantity here, the, the from, coming to, from this point to this one. But you have to subtract the amount of rolling times, uh, the, the, let's say, this angle that we have here, delta phi, times R, that's the radius here. Okay, this is a very particular scenario, but it, this can be, be generalized for more complex uh, geometries as well. That what, that's what we did. And so we redefined all this based on this idea of the rolling, but for general surface and so on. And with that, we imagine that we have this, uh, uh, let's say, this snapshot here showing this configuration, and another one showing a next configuration. So usually you can have change in the normal direction of the, the contact, what they call here MB. So the bodies may have a, a rigid body a movement, so the, the normal of the contact may change. And you can track the new material points taking place here. These are the, the material points that uh, have contact here, taking place here in this position. You can find these points in the next configuration where we used to have contact in the previous one and the new ones as well. And this distance between these guys here and here, they come to you, uh, come gives to you, gather to you somehow the information of, uh, of this lighting and uh, that, could, uh, that could have happened here between them. And based on that, we define uh, these quantities and define the tangential gap quantity like this. This is this is, was done in a no work. Uh, uh, I think it was 2017. I think. Yeah, I think it, it's real here. We fear is it. Then we applied all this for beam to beam contact. Used here some parameterizations of our beams to 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 let's say to show the external surfaces of the beams and so on. And um, yeah, here are some examples of parameterizations to show the beam's external surface. I will not go into details here. This is a, a cross section, what we call the super elliptical cross section. It may recover many shapes. It's quite interesting to play with this. 
you can change the A and B, uh, same axis here, and also this exponent add here in order to recover almost rectangular shapes or circular ones and so on. It's quite convenient. And um, yeah, so based on that, we, we can handle contact between beings considering the surface themselves. And for example, trading problems such as this one, the bean rolling on the other ones. This is a, a simple example when we would like to, to, to see how it's uh, behaving. Uh, when you have an impulsive loading applied here, at the beginning you have some sliding and then friction comes. I'll show the, the video, I hope it works, uh, you can see. So you have some sliding at the beginning and then after it's some rolling. Usually the frame doesn't seem very well while uh, sharing the screen. So uh, probably I, I don't think you see the video in a very, really, really smooth way. But uh, it's what we have now. <laughs> If you, for example, put a, a different shape of me, for example, this one, and I'll just pull a little bit to the side and we make some tests, for example, varying the friction force and so on. So for example, this case, it's quite interesting. You have almost something, other. then the energy, the mechanical energy of the system is capped and you have this, uh, the kinetic energy increase and then the potential energy drops while the band, it recovers. Again, it's quite nice. So this coefficient of friction point 25 permitted we to do that with no dissipation of energy, for example, because we didn't have sliding here in this problem. So it's only sticking. And the interesting thing is that uh, if you look at this problem, uh, let's say uh, 2D, uh, let's say we have a single, uh, in this case, I think it was three beams. So we have actually uh, three pairs of contact actually, not, 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 nothing more than that. You don't have to, let's say, make a discretization of contact along this surface here. Uh, the, the local contact problems makes the, this, the, the job for you. It automatically finds where is the contact point where contact took place or would like to take place while you are changing the configuration of these things. So if you have a, a smaller friction, for example, you can have some sliding. So. You have some dissipation of energies, as you see here, the mechanical energy, the green dot line here, uh, uh, here. and uh, yeah, the potential energy increasing and uh, some energy dissipated here. It's quite interesting. And if you have a smaller friction coefficient, then you have much sliding. And then dissipation taking place for longer, as you see here as well. Here another example, now uh, going to the flexible beam, for example, uh, just look at this. You can see this very, very flexible beam that just rolling a little sliding on the, this uh, uh, rigid surface here. Just showing the previous example it was a rigid body, a rigid beam on, a, on another one. This is a flexible beam in a pair of rigid ones. Here is a, a trampoline. Actually, this is a projectile made of beans. And here, all this is made of beans as well. So you have some nice, interesting patterns like this. You just drop it and you have these patterns of, uh, of uh, going up and down and so on. So uh, all these uh, regions here, every point here, is uh, you, ha you have this contact interaction taking place here in between this uh, beam's uh, surface. And also the interactions between the projectile itself with the, with the trampoline as well. So here, uh, some example that shows us how complex can be a model like this. You have many contact interactions. Actually, uh, many, in this case, I think almost thousands of it. I'm, I'm not sure about the number. Uh, yeah. Uh, here is a frame. Uh, just, just call. Just telling us uh, how are the, let's say the, uh, the tension loads and uh, let's say the normal the tensile forces in each of these yarns here that you have this uh, as elastic bands actually not yarns in this scale here but elastic bands. Uh, then we have this in this case. Uh, just prior to go to it, some question. Uh, can you explain the criteria for classifying surface as master or slave? Yes, I should. I can explain. This is a very good question. Yeah. 
usually when you would like to use uh, the master's master slave schemes you need to uh, define as the master uh, let's say as the, as the master surface uh, de depends on the way uh, for example I, I think it's easier for me to explain like this I'll make a draw a small draw here so imagine that you have a finite element mesh here like this and another one here it's a not the best but the best drawing but i think it's uh, it's possible to understand imagine that you have this and this looks to be this seems to be a face of elements for example so you have left uh, you have a coarser mesh in the bottom and a, a more refined mesh in the top here usually what you what you have to do is to define the slave points on the more uh, refined mesh why that because what will you check for each slave point you have to test if it comes into this surface for example imagine that this body goes down here so i will draw in red color here this body comes down here so in, and imagine that your nodes are your slave points here so you choose this guy as a slave body and this is a master one so for example you you detected that this guy has no contact and this this guy has contact this guy has contact and this guy has no contact so if you do like this you can you do can detect contact by this way because this and these contacts are detected in this case okay if you choose this this four nodes here as slave points so you can detect their contact in this master surface but now let's uh, change the idea let's let's say that we choose these slave points not these guys not the red guys here but the black ones so if you have such a scenario like this you cannot detect this contact because you have only two slave points here and both of them you don't have contact so to answer you let's say roughly speaking usually the more refined body should be the slave one okay this is the basic idea there are more guidelines for example if you have convex and concave bodies usually the convex one should be the slave one the concave one should be the master one some people can tell you that sometimes but roughly speaking i would go in my opinion the more important uh let's say crit criterion in order to define which is the, the slave and which is the master guy is re, uh, regarding the refinement you have and the number of slave points it's a matter of uh, of uh, actually um, the de contact detection and uh, actually uh, and let's see the number of points you are going to choose in order to, to try to detect better your geometry so the more points you have usually you can detect better yeah, your geometry itself is it clear Can we do simulation? Let, let me just uh, see. I am Han, uh, who from the University of Liverpool concerned the LCP. What if one of the surface has a large local curvature that make it difficult to converge to find the projection point? Let me try to understand your idea. Yeah, let, what if one of the surfaces has a large local curvature you are thinking please uh, if you could explain me uh, a bit uh, Han, who, uh, what you think uh, uh, what, do, what do you mean with large uh, local curvature in, in what sense uh, i cannot imagine uh, geometrically what you, what you are thinking of can you please describe me a bit or i don't know maybe i can try to so let's say that we have a flat surface here and uh, so you have, if you have this LCP here so the solution is this point okay but if you have for example this and this then the solution is this point it's okay but I think maybe we're wondering if you have something like this for example is it then, uh, then 
if you have such a kind of things, for example, contact will not be exactly, this is the, let's say, the uh, local minimum, for example, but you have other ones, where you have an intersection point that mathematically maybe exists here, but actually sometimes this can be a problem. You can have this part of your surface, and this is another part of it, for example, and you detect that contact maybe is not here in this part, but it's in another region of the other one. Is it? Uh, I don't know if I understand your point. Well, maybe I can. He seems to say that master surface has fluctuation, maybe something like a sinusoidal surface or something. Is it what uh, it might be? What, Ajay? Please, could you repeat that? Um, maybe something like a sinusoidal surface or like some kind of a rough surface. Could that be the what he's... A rough surface. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So you mean uh, something like uh, really like or some something like this? And yeah, here, yeah I think so. I guess so. Okay. If this, I think, for example, this. If this is the case, probably uh, the master master scheme. I think probably is not the best way to handle this kind of problem. Okay, because it's quite complex. You can have multiple solutions here for the local control problem. For example, these, 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 many solutions, for example. And uh, probably this is not the best way to handle this. This problem would be handled, for example, probably, for example, defining many slave points and doing master slave correctly, or maybe by the mortar method or so on to, to have an average value here, for example. Or you can really go to, to this small scale here and try to really solve this uh, local. Uh, solution, but uh, probably uh, I wouldn't go to, to this kind of problem, the master master method. I don't think it's the best uh, uh, best strategy for this, okay? I think this, uh, I hope this answers your question. Okay. And, uh, okay, yeah, yeah, okay, it's clear now. I don't know if I answered. Can we do simulation like rubber ball bouncing with hard surface and flexible surface? I think this is possible, Hajash. Yes. Uh, I did some uh, simulations already, not with the uh, very uh, rubber ball, but uh, with a rigid ball, but with some local, uh, let's say, penetration permitted, uh, according, for example, to a Hertz contact. Uh, scenario, but it's not very, let's say, flexible ball, as you imagine, probably. But I think in this case, it's possible to, to handle the problem, but I, I think if the ball is too flexible, probably maybe the best way to handle that is not also with the master-master technique, but not master-master-slave technique, because actually, when the ball, ball is very flexible, the point-wise contact assumption is no longer valid, because actually you have a large contact area. So I think it's not the best way to do that. Master-master contact schemes are very uh, prone to situations where you really have point-wise actions, point-wise uh, contact actions. Uh, for example, when you have rigid bodies, discrete elements, quite nice for this, so because uh, you have, uh, let's say, point-wise uh, contact in some uh, scenarios. And what else? Uh, for example, for multi-body dynamics, I think it's a nice way to handle as well because usually when you have rigid bodies, uh, yeah, it's quite convenient, I think. And contact between beings or uh, what I did so far is sort of being in shells and so on in some situations, and, and that's it. Uh, yeah, let me see if there's some more thing. Yes. Okay, this we talked about already. Maybe he's trying to talk about singularity, a sharp edge at one surface. Definitely, I should talk here about the uh, singularity and so on. Singularities are always a problem, but they can be handled sometimes when you do. Uh, unfortunately, it would be impossible to go into details on this, but if you have a sharp corner, for example, like this, you can have, for example, a surface like this. You can define here as a master master between this surface and this one, and another one between this surface and this one. And you can degenerate the master surface on the top here, for example, this left side one, on, into a single point, recovering the master slave problem. 
for this particular uh, case here. Uh, with that, you can use master master as a source of other, uh, let's say, contact schemes. As a, uh, for example, the master slave one or other schemes. This uh, was object of two papers that we published uh, in last years. They are referenced here. I think I can briefly show some more examples. I'll jump some examples here. These are multibody for train simulation and so on. Impact simulation, what we have here, small gaps. So we have the, the impact loads and so on. This is a part of a, of a, a boogie of a, uh, of a train. This, for example, for mechanism, for example, a can follower mechanism have some uh, flexible beams here and there's some uh, universal joints here. You can just, a can follower here with springs. And you see this uh, bottom up uh, pattern here. This is the general way to it was described. It's in this paper, you can have a look afterwards. You have some dumping here. All oh, this is the master master. There's a special kind of, let's say, master, master, what I call master slave contact between spheres and surface. This may be seen as an enhanced master slave technique or a particular case of, ma of master, master one. So I don't not go, go into details here, but the similar way that I described so far, but one of the bodies is a sphere. It's a particular case. We do that, we define many surfaces here to, to have contact. You can find the ball that uh, you asked, for example, this is a rigid ball just bouncing here and have some dissipation of energy. And afterwards, it's pulled to the, in the y direction here and it starts uh, to roll on the surface. So it's nice because we, we can have a solution of this problem, this analytical solution, so we have matching, completely matching here. After we did some nice tests, imagine this, this example is very interesting. Imagine this ball that's coming and approaching a hole. And you have a, a, a large friction, for, for example, 0.3 in this case. So you have no sliding condition. So the ball comes into the hole and escapes the hole because it does not slide. It does not leave any energy, does not dissipate energy. So it can, uh, it changes its uh, uh, direction of, uh, of, uh, of velocity and angular velocity and so on, but it does not dissipate energy. Okay, now come to a very small friction. Then you can have some alternating rolling and sliding, then the ball comes captured because it loses energy due to this sliding. So it became inside the hole. On the other hand, if you have zero, zero uh, friction, you have a lot of sliding, of course, and you have completely uncoupled angular movement of the translational one. And the ball, of course, does not dissipate energy and goes and, and it leaves the hole as well, even sliding all the time. It's quite interesting. Yeah, here I'll jump. More details on beam to beam. You, know, you can see afterwards, I'll let me cue the slides. Special kind of local contact problem. There are details on papers and so on. We can handle for beams, for example, self-contact like this, all this uh, handled by uh, regions of contact that we can have here. And uh, this kind of, uh, there was a question about sharp corners. For example, imagine that you have a tip of a beam in contact, in contact with uh, the body, it's, the, the beam itself here. Or we'd like to have, <clears throat> let's say, a general point-wise contact formulation comes uh, given, to, given to us a special scheme that we have, uh, uh, for example, these blue lines here as a special curves that come from the parameterization of this of this beam BD here. So uh, we can recall, we can uh, degenerate our surface parameterization on, into some curves here, and or into some points here. So recovering that uh, formulation here uh, with which is a contact between a curve and a surface or a point and the surface as a master slave and so on. With that, we can have many interesting problems such as, I'm not going into details here, I'll let the mathematics for, for other opportunity. Yeah. Just show, show the examples. Yeah. 
Okay. So imagine that we have two beings in contact. So we, here we degenerate the master-master uh, formulation into a curve-to-curve -curve formulation. So we have here a contact between two surfaces degenerated into these curves that I've just talked to you. So we have this contact with large displacements and large uh, rotations as well. <coughs> Capture it. If we have parallel beams, for example, at this time we degenerated our master-master scheme into a master slave one, so we have this contact very well handled in this case with point wise uh, uh, already assumed uh, positions here uh, where we, we degenerated our surface onto slave points. In this case that I showed uh, previously, uh, we degenerated our surface in this uh, beam into uh, uh, some curves, and then we just uh, slided it onto the, the other one. So it's possible to handle such a kind of things, for example. It's quite nice. And the last one is this, that, that uh, imagine that we have a contact with a singularity. So if you try to solve this problem, you just put the one being apart the other one, it fails. You have penetration there. On the other hand, if you put a, another uh, in the tip of the beam, an extra contact with the contact between this curve, this blue curve, and the surface of the beam AC here. Then you have this, and then you can solve it. Because at the very end of the simulation, you have here this as a, a singularity. You have this, on, on the, please uh, note that this uh, force, this normal force here in red, is not orthogonal to this uh, surface here of the beam here. It loses this orthogonality because this is a, actually a, a singularity at the tip of the beam. That's why we do that. Some more examples. Uh, you have a ball here. Just uh, you just pull it, and you can make it uh, having contact with the channel, as you see here, and so on. In this case here, it's a single point of contact, a single contact search for all the simulation. It changes automatically its position according to the local contact problem being solved along simulation. And lastly, then, uh, you can do that with nerve surface. It's quite uh, popular nowadays to do that because due to some schemes uh, of IGA or so and related stuff. So we can uh, use it together with uh, um, master master technique with nerves, for example, like this, just falling the ground, we have a single contact defined here. It changes automatically the position according to the where the body touches the ground. So we have this complex pattern here, and here's the trajectory of the body center of the body a long time. Where it started in this uh, square and then went by this kind of uh, trajectory plot from the from the view from the top. And also, lastly, uh, um, another sk uh, recent scheme published this year that we did uh, distinguish between static and dynamic coefficient of friction, and we made contact between a beam and a shell surface, but the tip of the shell here. And uh, if you look at this, you see this kind of patterns of it goes and stops, goes and stops. If you look at the force against time uh, versus time here, the normal force is plotted here in black, and the friction force is in red here. So what occurs here? You have the, okay, you have this uh, friction being uh, claimed more and more until it achieves the maximum friction available. That's uh, the coefficient of friction times the normal. That's here uh, plotted as well as, uh, as, uh, as this uh, black curve here, but put, uh, multiplied by the friction coefficient. So we would call it max uh, 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 force of uh, friction force, max is static. So we have this, it's a blue dot line here. So when the red line achieves the blue one, it drops because we, we achieved this sliding condition, then the coefficient of friction falls. And we, we come by this part here and then, until we recover the static condition, then it experiences again this, this static, this static friction until it achieves the limit again, and then starts sliding again, and so on. So as I play again here, you can see, you are pulling to the right direction here, you experience this slide, 
stick, slide, stick, slide, stick. Why are the shell is, is shaking here? Because you were introducing here some, some kind of uh, load due to contact and it, it, you are uh, exciting uh, the, the structure. And the last one, which is the title that I uh, put in the, the talk, it's a buckling, it's a shell dome instability due to contact uh, with a beam. So you have a shell dome here and just put downwards the beam and starting the forming the shell here we have a start of a buckling uh, instability here and then another patterns of very interesting inst instability occurring here and contact taking place in other regions here so this is an instability uh, caused by contact loads of this uh, this beam here with this shell surface here all this was done with the master master technique but in this case they generated onto a master slave one but the same um, let's say implementation of master master technique, but only degenerated to master's. So, I mean, uh, some conclusions. So, sorry for, because I, I was a little hurry at some parts, I, I, I couldn't go into details of local contact problem, for example. But okay, the idea is to give an overview of contact mechanics and also in the master master technique and related story. I, I try to do that. So I can conclude with uh, saying to you that point-wise contact formulations may be very useful for handling contact in some particular scenarios of rigid or flexible bodies. In this case, master-master uh, contact schemes and its degenerations can be useful to produce a family of contact formulations for multiple applications, such as beam beam, beam shell, rigid body with rigid body, and particles with discrete element method, for example. And what we can do by now for re doing research, for example, in these topics, more elaborated, more elaborated interface laws, for example, may be handled to consider local physics uh, of contact and uh, its influence on macro level models. For example, how to manage normal and friction forces. By now, the implementations here are quite uh, simple in this, uh, from this point of view. We've been using normal penalty approach, that's a linear spring in the normal direction, and uh, for friction force we're using uh, tangential penalty and Coulomb model, for example, the more enhanced model that I showed here, it's a Coulomb with two conflictions of friction, for example, the, the static and the dynamic one, but it could be much more elaborated. And new, uh, the challenging applications, for example, for granular materials that are in development by now, okay? I hope uh, in the near future we can see some uh, publication on that topic as well, I hope. Here are some acknowledgements uh, for all this. Uh, University of Sao Paulo, FAPESP, CNPQ, Valley, CAPES, and uh, Alexander von Humboldt Foundation for sponsor sponsoring uh, the research related to, to this in some point. Yeah, there are many projects along the, the, the last years that uh, in, this. Let me see if you have some more questions. I don't see, I see no more questions, but well, I'm here. Ajay, please, uh, if you want to have some questions. Hey. Or... Yeah, I, I think there was like some several interesting questions already out there. And uh, uh, one thing I was uh, interested in is the dynamics. Yep. And how are you treating the dynamics and what kind of numerical integrations are you using the numerical integration and like a, uh, time integration schemes? Okay, good question. I didn't talk about it. By now, we are using Newmark method. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, because Newmark method, it's a, it's a traditional method. It works pretty fine in, in this case. It has some problems. It's well known that, for example, in some problems where you have uh, large rotations, you sometimes new mark schemes uh, do not uh, preserve energy or or uh, angular momentum, for example. Uh, even in simple problems when you have, uh, uh, let's say, a, a rigid body with large displacements and rotating and so on, uh, then probably we would uh, need some more elaborated schemes such as energy momentum schemes. Uh, there are many work, nice works in literature that handle that well. By now, what we have implemented here is new mark method, 
it's uh, for, by now it's working pretty fine for these examples we are working with. Okay, but it okay. could be improved. And also, what I, I think it could be improved. Uh, these kind of schemes could be tested as well in explicit schemes. I never did that. Mm, and yeah. Probably it's something that could be also tested. Yeah. Uh, because even in Riga's book, he talks about this generalized alpha method. I think uh, if you have noticed, uh, I think it's somewhere in the, uh, where he talks about that as a very good technique for especially addressing dynamic problems. Uh, so that's why I was very curious about the, what kind of numerical uh, uh, integration technique, uh, not time integration techniques is being used there. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I mean, so if, if anybody has any questions, you can always unmute yourself and uh, just uh, ask. I think uh, Alfred was, uh, has like a, is given like a really comprehensive uh, uh, discussion on contact here, right from starting from the gap function and uh, discussing the variation form, how it is formulated and everything. Uh, and if there are any questions, please feel free to ask. And in the meantime, uh, one other question I had, like so I, I, I know that you're using ASGEN, right, for all the formulations. Yeah. Uh, but uh, so all, is uh, the entire giraffe based on ASGEN or are there uh, other elements that were uh, coded before uh, by hand coded or done something on that nature? Yeah, actually, uh, the first formulations that implemented in giraffe, uh, it was hard coded, everything. Uh, when okay. I, I was not using this gen. But okay. uh, after I start using this gen, then it's possible to work with, let's say, more uh, enhanced schemes for parameterization of surface, for example, when you have a compli complicated uh, derivatives and so on, you don't have to, to, to worry about it because this gene does it for you. So, right. Uh, right. so, so let's say, uh, I have some hard-coded parts of, of giraffe, but also but now uh, I'm only using ASGEN uh, and it's working pretty fine. Okay, I see, I see. Yeah. yeah. Uh, any other questions? Okay, and another question about this. Uh, some of the people in this contact and dynamics, they seem to use this complementarity approaches. Have you come across that at any time? I, I'm not very familiar with that. I, I've read some things. Uh, where I, th I think you worked with a little with this, right? Uh, right. Yeah. Uh, so people from multi-body field they usually uh, are interested in this top in these topics, right? Yeah. 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 They look at it as like something like a optimization problem, where you're trying yeah. to optimize the gap to be zero in a way. Uh, I mean. I mean, philosophically, everything is the same. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's, that's, uh, I, I was just wondering if there was any chance of you having come across that or if having compared how, it, how that uh, scales in comparison to the standard finite element for contact. Yeah, uh, it's a nice way to, uh, I'm, as I said, I'm not very familiar with this, these techniques. Okay. But uh, I'm sure it can be compared, and uh, it would be worth to do that. <laughs> right. And uh, when there, so when I, like, I think there's a question by one of the uh, participants. Is Giraffe software free to public? Actually, Giraffe is, uh, I wouldn't say, it's not a public software, because actually it's not, not you don't have to pay for it as well, of course. Uh, but... Uh, uh, it's not publicly uh, available because I cannot give because I don't have a team to give support for the software. So th that's me and my students. So what do you do? If you are interested in using Giraffe, let me know. Send me an email. I can uh, share with you a, a Dropbox folder with some contents of Giraffe, and then you can use it uh, as long as you don't uh, pass the third third party at. Uh, Third party uh, without my authorization is the only concern I ask. And uh, of course, if you publish something using Giraffe, you just refer to the articles and that's it. To the, to the, yeah, that's the important thing. So if you are interested in using it, you, you can let me know. Yeah. 
So I think with uh, when you share the presentation, maybe you can have a slide with the contact information and uh, best way to for anybody who is interested in Giraffe to get in touch with you. I think that could be the best way to when I share it with them and yeah. uh, they can probably. Yeah, I think yeah. it's probably there, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's here. My email is here. It's uh, fred.gy.usp.br. It's in the presentation. I'll share with you at the PDF afterwards. So if you, if you want to uh, have a look at Giraffe and so on, please let me know. Yeah. yeah. So if somebody is interested in getting in touch with Alfred, I mean, want to uh, use Giraffe, I think you can get in touch with Alfred and he'll going to share it with you. And I think that's a uh very nice software i think manual is also really well written with a lot of examples and example problems to try it out as well uh i mean when i look at like commercial software i think your manual is pretty much on par with one of them right i would say so it's really well written a lot of uh, examples and uh, I mean, very easy to understand i would say not like uh, convoluted uh, and uh, <laughs> Thanks for that. Yeah, it takes no time to do it. Uh, right. And also, would like to thank all the students that helped me with examples mainly because uh, uh, usually what I do is uh, every student that makes a research with me after in the end of the research is usually responsible to make a tutorial for giraffe related to somehow something that he, he or she did during the, the, the research. So it's quite nice because uh, I introduced this, let's say, a couple of years ago, and we have already, I think, 16 tutorials in Giraffe, which is, uh, some of them are very simple, but um, there are more uh, complicated ones as well. And uh, it's a way to, let's say, uh, keep uh, uh, information of how to manage some kinds of problems using Giraffe and so on. What are the strategies that we can handle and so on. So, yeah. Uh, everything is, uh, is in a Giraffe uh, users. Uh, there's a user's menu and the, the tutorials guide that is the one that is applied, uh, as I mentioned. So we try to keep it updated. It's very difficult because it's uh, a small uh, team, but we try to do that. We try our best. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, I can understand completely. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, regarding, since you're now working on the granular materials, I had one question about the rigid body contact, right? So even in rigid body contact, you have like iteration step. So is it uh, uh, just a standard time integration or you, do you have like internal Newton loop as well to make sure that these uh, uh, rigid particles are not interpenetrating? Yeah, when, when you think about uh, rigid bodies, rigid particles, let's say. Right, yeah. Yeah, then uh, you can, uh, I think you can use the same schemes that I mentioned. Uh, of course, you can enhance more, but you, first you have this rough search. Then you go to the contacts that uh, are prone to occur. But at the end, usually what's important is to verify that you missed some contact. For example, you, at the end of the, the step, you can, uh, you can uh, try to find again if uh, a given contact was not considered proper by another search. This cost, every search you, you do, you pay a cost for it, of course. Uh, computation right, exactly. It's expensive, but uh, it, uh, it's a way to, to avoid penetrations uh, that are not feasible, not physics, uh, related to physics of the problem. So uh, it's a way to try to do that. And, uh, that that's, that's my... Uh thought that like when you have a lot of particles, then you would end up spending a lot of time just searching if there's contact or if there's no contact. I mean, of course, it probably if it's a pure spherical particle, it will be more easy to say that if something is two particles are in this distance, then they have like a, they're in contact or not. But still then it becomes an N square problem, right? Because if you have N number of particles, you need to search with every other N minus one particle to see if there's a contact. Or probably you need to at least search if they're in a particular radius and then for them you need to again somehow. At the end of the day, you have to calculate a distance function, whether they're inside a particular radius or whether they're outside. Like, I mean, I think they do similar thing in, mo uh, in molecular dynamics. I mean, of course, just that instead of a contact, they have a potential function. Yeah. And from a potential function, a force is derived. I mean, technically, similar stuff can be done with contact as well. Yep. Uh, but again, my concern is, the, is there a workaround for that uh, to ensure that you're not stuck with the N-square problem? 
if you're not stuck with the what again uh, uh, with a with a, like n square problem right so you have one particle then you need to search for every other n minus one particle yeah, that, for that, every that, particle that. you need to do that right i mean yeah to n square i understand yeah this 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 is always a problem uh, actually you have some schemes to to like uh, oct tree schemes for example to to divide your space in parts and try to decrease the searching that you have to pay but uh, I think this is usually the bottleneck of particle models. When you have uh, many, many particles, this can be really uh, expensive, computationally speaking. So I, I, I don't see a miracle to avoid that, I see. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, uh, the thing that is you can handle contacts using this kind of formulations, but uh, it's intrinsic to the problem of, let's say, grains are many many particles, you have to search a lot. Uh, it's, it's part of the problem. Uh, I don't right. know if right. to avoid it. <laughs> right. So, I mean, so I'm guessing that then Giraffe is able to do, because I remember that you said that Paradiso is a, a, a solver, something is there in there, right? So, yes. Giraffe should be able to do parallel simulations, I'm guessing. Using OpenNP uh, only, not uh, that's what I did by now. And uh, okay. you, using the resources of uh, of the Pardiso as well uh, that we implemented, uh, that we are using the library itself. Okay, yeah. nice. Pardiso with the uh, MKL implementation that we have to, to Jira. Okay, okay. I see, I see, I see. Okay. So, I mean, so by chance, did you get, a, get to test of, like, um, try to test it on how the how it scales in terms of uh, or maybe the particle research I know is pretty new, right? So, but I, well, I was wondering if you got a chance to scale the parallel behavior of giraffes. Let's see. Uh, this I'm working right now. Here, what's okay. what I'm doing here? <laughs> this is quite I new see, nice stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, because I remember uh, I I don't know if you remember Bilshan, right? At IKM, he was doing these particle methods. Uh, so he used to have these uh, uh, huge number of particles that he was doing with them, I think, uh, discrete element method as well. Uh, so that's why I was very curious about how it was scaling. And I remember that he was using thousands of cores or something, if I'm correct. Yeah. Uh, and so that's why I was like wondering about the scaling behavior of uh, how, how giraffe would scale. And that would be very important eventually to get the... Uh, uh, discrete element uh, or like the yeah. the are methods working right yeah this is this is important scaling is uh, an issue when you when you have these problems mm -hmm. and I would say more uh, I think uh, actually if you if you want to take this let's say let's imagine that we start having the discrete element modeling with giraffe let's say that it works and but uh, okay then to go to a next step of really modeling something uh, real that we would like to do. I think it's a natural way is to go for more deep computations, for example, using GPU uh, coding and so on, because actually this is what we need. If you look at all the commercial particle softwares, usually they use GPU to do. And they, 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 they right. work a lot they work a lot for scaling using GPUs. So uh, all these uh, Geomet geometric search and so on, all this is handled used by this GPU code. This is not straightforward to be done, but for sure it's a, a research uh, work to be done together with this kind of contact techniques as well. So, right. it's definitely important. Okay, interesting. All right. So, I have another uh, question just about the contact, something that I'm trying to work on. Um, like, so when you have like let's say bodies moving in a fluid yeah and then they're coming into contact then would we be able to use the same ideas again with fluid yeah i mean for example hmm. let's say if you think of like a chemical spill or something right so there's a lot of debris that's flowing in a fluid then that would that's an interesting problem to look at so then you have a lot of uh Let's say, you can think of each of these, let's say, oil barrels or something as like a particle in a fluid. Yes, fluids are much more complicated, I think. If you want to put particles inside the fluid, what you can do? Some particular scenarios, you can use sometimes some, uh, let's say, uh, 
equations that are already developed to, to trade somehow the, I would say, hydrodynamics effect in case of, uh, for example, what I experienced in the past, for example, that, that I showed you, the riser modeling, for example. Right, it's not yeah. But I've been inside the water. How, how to manage that? Right. You know? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, that's why yeah. I was curious. Yeah, in that case, for example, you have some uh, equations. It's called, for example, Morrison's equation, where you mm -hmm. can... Uh, like a special, a special equation with uh, some hydrodynamic coefficients that are already evalu pre-evaluated and given to you. Uh, and then you can just uh, plug that into a non-linear uh, dissipation, a dissipative equation that also can handle C current, for example, as a uh, velocity now, also uh, according to the... To the place you are, you are trying to, to, to simulate uh, according to the, to, to the location. And so in the environment data. So in this, let's say, case, when you have such a kind of equation with many assumptions to make it valid, you can put fluids in the story, but, but this way. But if you want to really solve, solve the, the stream, let's say, the, the fluid, then, the, 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 then it's another thing. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's much more expensive. You have to couple, for example, with a CFD or so on, or, or right. maybe maybe other techniques as, as uh, anyway, for example, when you were working with uh, uh, wind turbines, for example, when you have the blades, mm -hmm. you can model the blades within beam elements, for example, but if you want to have actually the, the, the fluid, the air, uh, stream around the, the blades and the mold and so on. You can go to a CFD approach, for example, it's much more expensive, but some people try to use, for example, the, let's see, the, the panel methods, for example, that can be a mm -hmm. solution for, let's say, an average solution, let's say, in the middle. But on the other hand, you have lighter solutions, computationally speaking, such as blade element momentum technique, for example, that's quite similar to the idea of uh, drag and lift curves, uh, aerodynamic uh, mm -hmm. curve, and uh, somehow corrected by some uh, theories, uh, simple theories, and uh, you can have a first guess, let's say. Usually when you, when you want to, to model wind turbine, for example, usually this is the first approach, for, for example, for designing some uh, blade and so on. You need to make a multi-body dynamics model of the whole system. Usually, mm -hmm. This is a very common approach. It's called BEM, the blade element momentum method, for example. It, I so see, I see. It's a way to put the fluid in the story, but uh, you can have many strategies for doing that uh, according to complexity that you want to do that. Yeah. I see. Okay. And then that's an interesting uh, perspective to have. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Thank you very much, Alfredo. You're welcome. Uh, if you have any more questions, uh, please let me know. And yes, thanks again for the, the opportunity of talking to you. And it was a great pleasure. And good. <laughs> uh, is there uh, any other questions? I think it's already about two and a half hours. We have taken a lot of time from Alfredo now. Oh. And uh, uh, if there are no other questions, then maybe we can uh, uh, conclude the talk here. And I would like to thank everybody who joined in today. And uh, I think it was there were some very interesting questions. And uh, I think a really informative lecture. I think uh, there's something to take away for both the beginners who are like very new to contact mechanics and also for those who uh, have some idea about it already. And still, there's a lot of things to learn from the lecture, I think. And I would thank Alfredo for taking his weekend and uh, joining us. and. Uh, talking to us about this. And uh, thank you very much, Alfredo. And thank you, everybody, for joining in. And uh, uh, please do subscribe if you want to get updates about the lecture. I will send a link in the chat. And then we would probably be sending you not more than one email per week whenever there's a lecture in there. So thank you, everybody, and have a nice weekend.